Welcome to the Remembering Life podcast. I'm your host, Holly Ignatowski, and today we're talking with Claire Bidwell Smith, therapist, grief expert, and author of three books. Today we'll be talking about her book, The Rules of Inheritance, which is a memoir about the years before and after the deaths of both of her parents. We'll be exploring the unique grief that follows the death of a parent and how Claire, having lost both parents by age 25, began and continues on her complicated grief journey. We'll also talk about how she keeps the memories of her parents alive. Welcome, Claire, and thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Your book, The Rules of Inheritance, contains very deeply personal reflections. It's very open, very honest about your experiences, both before and after the deaths of each of your parents. Why was that important for you to tell your story? You know, my parents both got cancer at the same time when I was 14, and I'm an only child. And so my whole high school adolescence was this roller coaster of hospitals and chemos and kind of learning about mortality at this time in my life when none of my peers were contemplating those things or going through anything like that. And when my mother died when I was 18, it just really dropped the floor out from underneath me. And I felt really alone. Um, I didn't know where to turn until finally I just started turning to books. I'd always been a reader as an only child. I spent my childhood just reading all the time. And so I started reading memoirs, anything I could get my hands on. It didn't have to be about grief, but something hard somebody went through um, and came out the other side. And they each book kind of gave me a glimpse into how I might make it through my own journey. And when I began to write my book, um, I'd always been a writer since I was a little kid, and it was what I'd been pursuing in high school and college. And when I began to write my book, I just really thought about all those books that had meant so much to me, and I wanted to write something that might help somebody else out there going through their grief journey. This was a very open, honest book about your journey with grief. Did you find that difficult or cathartic? A little bit both, I think. Um, you know, again, all those books I had read, it was the ones who, the, the, the authors who were really honest about the hard stuff, the ones who really kind of laid bare their pain, the messes they made, the ways that they made mistakes. And um, I kind of felt like if I were going to really write this book, I couldn't gloss over my own stuff. And it was cathartic to write. I was scared to put it out there. But once I did, it was all exactly those very honest and hard parts. The worst things about myself that I wrote in that book were the very pieces that resonated with readers. And by the time you were 25 years old, both of your parents had died of cancer, as you stated. How do you think their deaths shaped you as a person today, uh, especially given that you were so young when they died? Gosh, let me count the ways. They shaped me so, in so many ways. I mean, initially, it was just tremendously difficult. Um, only recently have I been able to understand it as a form of trauma. And I think that that is a evidence of our culture changing around the idea of trauma. Back then, 25 years ago, when my mom died, I really thought about trauma as something for war veterans. Um, but we now understand clinically that trauma extends to much more than that, and sometimes it's much more nuanced. So I had been through a trauma, and I, and I had a lot that I needed to overcome, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression. As I became you know, more grounded, found support, got on my feet, I really realized that I have this unique understanding of death and end-of-life care that most people my age didn't. I was working in hospice by the time I was 29 um, as a result of that because I had, you know, had this glimpse and this view into what it means to be a caregiver, what it means to face end of life, what it means to go through grief and loss. And there was a lot I saw that was flawed and missing, so much support, so many conversations, a kind of openness and willingness to look at end-of-life care. And it was something that I just became very passionate about, wanting to help support others as they go through it. And to this day, that is my work. You did. You turned it into your profession, and now you're helping others. Out of curiosity, why did you call the book The Rules of Inheritance? Gosh, it was really hard to come up with a title for my life. <laughs> this book was about, at the time when I wrote it, I was about 30, and the book followed me from birth to 30. And so it felt like this whole, 
a tome about my life, and it was really hard to come up with a title. I had settled on the word inheritance, and that word just felt very resonant to me. You know, I had inherited a lot, a lot of love, a lot of pain, a lot of wisdom, and I just actually did a Google search on the word inheritance, and it was one of the first phrases that popped up, the rules of inheritance, and it's a legal term for stuff that happens with wills, um, but it, it just made sense to me. Um, I felt like it went along with the five stages of grief, which was a structure I was using for the book. Um, In the book, I structure the whole story between the five stages of grief, but not in an attempt to align with them as much as to show how fluid they can be, how so many people think they are a formula to follow, but really we come in and out of them. We dwell in some longer than others. And I felt like the best way to illustrate that was to show my own experience through that lens. And so the rules of inheritance kind of flowed along into that title. I'm actually working on a follow-up to it called The Rules of Forgiveness. Uh, Well, we can look forward to that book as well. And I did want to talk about how you divided the book into five parts for each stage of grief. And the denial section, the quote that you have from Elizabeth Kubler-Ross before that section struck me in that you say, there is a grace in denial. It's nature's way of letting in only as much as we can handle. Do you think that was your experience with denial in your grief journey? I think so. I love that quote so much. Elizabeth Kibler-Roth has so many quotes. I think um, she was such a pioneer in the grief world, and so much of her work is kind of misunderstood, but she really, you know, was looking at grief and loss in a way that, that nobody was at the time. Um, she paved the way for so much of the work that we're doing now in the, in the clinical world around grief. But that quote, um, you know, denial is, is, it is a way of, of finding some distance from the horrible pain and agony that we go through when we lose someone we love. And I went through many versions of denial. Um, in that first section, you see me leading up to my mother's death and the denial I was in that it was going to happen. Then you see me at 14 when they both got diagnosed and the denial I was in around that. And then you see me again at 25 as I'm approaching my father's death and yet again in, in denial. On the 10th anniversary of your mother's death, you wrote a letter to her. How did writing that letter help you um, both reflect on the past 10 years and also move forward. And do you still have that letter and occasionally read it? I do. I um, I have every letter I've written to her. I started writing to her on the very first anniversary of her death, and I found myself just climbing the walls wanting to talk to her and find some way to connect with her, to tell her how I was doing, to tell her how sorry I was for not having understood that she was dying. Um, And so every year on her death anniversary, which is January 24th, I write her a letter. And it's cathartic. It's painful. I cry every time, even this most recent year, which was 25 years. Um, But that 10-year letter I still have, and that was when I was 28 years old, and I felt like, gosh, I just want to be a regular person. I don't want to be constantly living within all this grief and identifying within so much loss and pain. I just want to be a person in the world. Um, And it was helpful to write, but I didn't actually let go of her or my grief (laughs) in some ways, but it keeps coming back around. Throughout the book, you you seem to look for your mother after she's passed, uh, even to the point of taking a completely just off the wall, almost dangerous trip to, I believe, the Philippines where you were going to go diving with sharks. And you say that you found your truth here. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it breaks my heart to hear, just to be reminded of how much I looked for my mother. I'm a mom now myself. I have a 13-year-old daughter and a 10-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. And I love them so much, and we're all so close, and I can imagine that same experience for them, looking for me. My mom and I had been so close, and I just couldn't fathom how I was going to live in the world without her. And there was this part of me that kind of thought she would come back, um, kind of thought I could find her again, thought if I took myself out to the farthest edges or dangled myself too far, maybe she would come back and save me. You know, it was a form of magical thinking. It was a form of bargaining. Um, Many people who are grieving go through phases and stages and thoughts like this. Um, And each time 
you know, I kind of almost had to prove to myself that she really wasn't coming back. But each time I got a little stronger, too, and each time I realized that I could be here without her and I was going to find my strength. And, in fact, so much of her was still inside of me. Um, and that was the kind of journey I really had to go on in my in my grief world was finding her within me, finding ways to stay connected to her and not in the ways that I once had been or hoped I could have again, but in new ways. You also talk about how there was sadness and guilt because you weren't there the night your mother passed. I'm not sure if you've reconciled that yet, but I wanted to read a quote from your book that your father had some words of wisdom for you regarding this. If I can just read, when you talk to him about that, he said to you, you're better off to have the 18 years so far and what you've got to go. Love what you've got, love what you've had. Think back and enjoy the past as you go ahead today, tomorrow. That's what the world is here for, why we are all here. Did that help you? Did that shift your thinking at all? In some ways. Um, it took me a long time to get over the guilt of not being there the night my mother died. Um, and it was a deliberate choice that I had made to stop. I was on my way to see her. My father had called to tell me that she was near the end. And I believe I, ha I, I thought there was more time, but I did stop to see a boy I had a crush on. I was a college student, and I was, you know, the... I was so scared and in so much denial of facing my mother's death. And I stayed overnight with this boy on the way, and my father called at 3 in the morning, and my mother was gone. And, gosh, the shame and guilt was so immediate, and it was so predominant in, in everything that I felt in those early years. I wanted to do anything to take it back. Um, I was so angry at myself. I was so sorrowful. I really couldn't figure out how to reconcile it for a long time, and I have absolutely now. And it's taken a lot of work. It's taken self-compassion. It's taken forgiveness. It's taken maturity and understanding that I was 18 and what I was going through wasn't something I was ever prepared for or would have known the right way to do. And it's also taken, um, you know, I've been a grief therapist for over a decade now, and Elizabeth Kubler-Ross has another great quote that says, guilt is perhaps grief's most painful companion. And I see guilt in so many of the clients I work with. And sometimes that guilt is for things that really happened or could have been prevented. And sometimes that guilt is more irrational and we cling to it. And what I've come to understand about guilt is that often we hold on to it as a way of holding on to the person. So in the work that I do as a therapist now, I try to help my clients find other ways to hold on to their person, other ways to connect to them. And when they can do that, they can often release some of that guilt. That's so real for so many people because you know, death is so final. And so if you have that guilt or that regret, mm -hmm. there's no way to really physically reconcile that. What advice do you have for your patients or people who are grieving the death of a parent with whom they maybe had a challenging or contentious relationship or they weren't there or there's there's something that they just can't get past? Yeah, it, it's really so common. So first, just normalizing it and having some compassion for yourself that you're feeling those things. Not all of us had a wonderful relationship like I did with my mother. Many of us have complicated relationships with our family members and loved ones. And when they're gone, that feels so final, you know, that the relationship now is set in stone as complicated. It feels as though we can't go back and reconcile or make amends or work through anything. But the truth is that our relationships never end. And there is actually a lot we can do to continue working through some of those complications. We can write letters to our loved ones. We can talk with therapists through things that we needed to work through. We can meet with spiritual and religious people to help us understand a larger framework uh, for our lives and theirs and these relationships. Um, I think it's really important to work through these things rather than letting them just sit and set in stone. Um, I also really urge anyone listening to think about, you know, are you holding on to that guilt as a way of holding on to your person? And the way to do that is to ask yourself, like, you know, when I thought about not feeling guilty about my mother's death that night, it just felt like every time I thought about letting go of that guilt, it felt like I was letting go of her, as though I just didn't care anymore. And that's not true at all. You can still care, and you can still wish you had been there. I still wish I'd been there. But I've released myself from that guilt, and I've found other ways to hold on to her and to connect with her. 
Also in your book, you say you were fortunate to get to know your father before his death, and that wouldn't have happened if your mom hadn't died first. Can you tell us more about that and what it meant for you to have that time with him? Yeah, my parents were unusual people, which is, you know, detailed in the book. My mother was 40 when I was born, and my father was 57. Um, He was so much older. You know, everyone thought he was my grandfather when I was a kid. And he was kind of the obvious one who would go first. If I were to lose my parents, even before they got sick with cancer, it was kind of, you know, this understated thing that my father would probably die before my mother. Um, And the opposite happened. And my mom had been magical and glamorous and really fun. And I had gravitated towards her naturally growing up and not really had that close of a relationship with my dad. And after she was gone, I mean, I remember sitting in the living room with him in the first week after she was gone and just, you know, we stared at each other. And here he had this teen daughter and I had this elderly father. And we were like, what are we going to do with each other? And eventually we forged this really beautiful relationship. And I had seven years with him before he died. And I really reflected on how I would not have had that time with him. I probably never would have gotten to know him the way I did had my mother not died. And what a strange gift that was. It was a really pivotal moment in my grief journey. In one section of the book in particular, you use personification to demonstrate how grief had completely embodied you. You write, Grief and I are left alone a lot. Grief holds my hand as I walk down the street, and grief doesn't mind when I cry because it's raining and I cannot find a taxi. You even write, Grief acts like a jealous friend, reminding me that no one else will ever love me as much as it does. Mm. Clearly, you could not get away from your grief. It became a part of you. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and how is grief a part of you today? And can anyone ever be done grieving? You know, I don't think we ever get over the loss of a loved one. um, And I don't think that should be our goal. I think that we learn to live with that loss. We learn to let it shape us in beautiful ways, in hard ways. But we don't ever need to be okay that they died or over it. But I also don't think that we need to be in an acute phase of grief forever either. At that time in my 20s, I just identified so heavily with my grief. And again, it was this time when none of my peers were going through this. And I just felt like such I was living in such a different world than everyone. And I had this thing, this grief that came around with me to everything. It touched every part of my life. And eventually, I learned to live with it in a different way. My grief is still with me. Um, I am not acutely grieving. I'm not um, caught up in it. I'm not crying frequently. I'm not feeling it. But these losses have shaped who I am. Um, They've shaped how I parent. They've shaped my marriage. Um, They've shaped my friendships. And, And I think that I've now turned it into something beautiful. Grief has become something that has made me appreciate my life, appreciate my relationships, appreciate my time here, um, make meaning out of my life. It's it's just been, it's become a great driving force. Um, It's been the thing that has really pushed me to want to help others go through it, help others understand how beautiful and transformative it can be. Um, But we need support in order to get to that place. Grief often becomes a timeline for us. We think about our life before the loss and after the loss. And you write that you didn't know how to explain yourself without the context of your mother's death. The deaths we experience, you know, especially those closest to us, really do shape who we are going forward. And it can be difficult to talk about yourself without the context of that loss. Can you share a little bit more about that? very common thing. Um, I was just talking to a client yesterday who is having trouble not talking about her grief and her losses, yet feeling like people around her don't quite understand when she does. I think it can, again, really kind of touch into every part of your life and become something that you identify with and identify as. And it's, it's, it's a part of us that we want other people to know about it and understand what we're going through or understand that we're living a little bit differently than they are. Our lives are a little different as a result of these losses. Um, we'll never be the same, um, nor should we want to. And, you know, I think that accepting that and talking about our grief and identifying with it is a way of accepting these losses, accepting um, the ways that we're going to be in the world now that it's different. You mentioned that you have children now, and obviously your children have never met your parents. 
How do you help them to get to know the grandparents that they never met to keep them alive for, for both them and you? Uh, I talk about my parents all the time. I try to talk about them and use uh, the phrase like your grandparents rather than my parents or my mom or my dad. I try to say, you know, your grandpa Jerry or your grandma Sally, just to remind them that, you know, in addition to the living grandparents that they have on their father's side, that they also have other grandparents um, who are influential in their lives. I put up pictures of them a lot. I try to change out the pictures because kids get bored. They stop noticing things in the house. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, um, <laughs> I'll swap out the photos here and there, and they'll, they'll notice. And they'll be like, oh, I've never seen that picture of your mom. And um, I try to do things and embody traits and values of my parents and demonstrate those to my kids and always mention them. You know, my mom taught me how to do this. Or or I'll also point things out about them like, oh my gosh, the way you said that was just like something my dad would have said or thought. Um, just to give them that sense of connection that these people are part of their lives and have, you know, brought in influence to who they will be and who they are. Are there other ways that you honor the lives of your parents and keep their memories alive, maybe just for yourself even? I think in my, all the work I do is a form of honoring them. You know, Mother's Day is coming up, and I'm doing multiple events to support women who have complicated Mother's Days, um, women who've lost children or babies, um, women who've lost moms. I'm constantly doing work to kind of support that world, and that feels like a great way to honor both of them. You know, I also do silly things like celebrate their birthdays. The kids and I made a cake for my mom uh, in March and sang to her, and and it was sweet and funny and, and good. Hmm. I understand that this book, The Rules of Inheritance, is being optioned for a television rights. Can you talk about that and where you're where you're at with that? Yeah. Um, Carrie Fisher, Star Wars Carrie Fisher, she has one daughter named Billy Lord. And Billy read the book and really connected with it. Billy is 29 years old. And going through the loss of her mom, Carrie, and her grandmother, Debbie Reynolds, was really difficult and also this very public experience of grief and nothing she read really resonated, she says, until she got to my book. And so we connected and we're actually writing and adapting it together. So we meet up regularly and have written a pilot and a whole season and it's really fun to work on. It's really fun to collaborate and just to really talk about grief and talk about young women who go through grief and the loss of a mom and we're trying to really portray all the parts of grief that don't get talked about, the funny parts, the messy parts, the crazy parts, you know, the beautiful parts, um, you know, the moments when you're trying to scatter some ashes and they blow back in your face, you know, like these whole ridiculous things that happen as you are going through grief and loss uh, that aren't normally talked about. So it's been a really fun project to work on. We ask all of our guests who they are remembering today. And I, I think we know who you're remembering. Is there anything in particular you want to share about your parents that maybe we didn't hear or we don't know? Um, you know, Mother's Day again is coming up, so I'm definitely remembering my mom. And she was just so funny and messy and wonderful. And I feel like she just taught me how to embrace, like, all the different parts of ourselves and of our lives that aren't perfect all the time. She was one of those people that made everybody feel better about exactly who they are. And and it's something that I've tried to bring into my work as a therapist and my my role as a mom and, and as a friend as well. We're all human and sometimes the the worst, messiest parts of ourselves are in fact the best parts. And she really kind of gifted me that that vision. Wonderful. Thanks so much for joining me today, Claire, and sharing your open, honest account of your grief journey. Your book, The Rules of Inheritance, is available. We'll, we'll tell people how they can get a copy of that. We also talked to you a few months back about your other book, Anxiety in the Missing Stage of Grief, which was wonderful. And you also have a third book after this, When Life is Over, Where Do We Go? So thank you so much for sharing your insight and experience with grief and helping others through their own. Thank you. I'm so grateful to you guys for having these conversations and opening up this space. It's so healing for so many. It is. 
And thank you to all of you for joining me today. For more information about Claire and her work, visit clairebidwellsmith.com. To enter to win a copy of Claire's book, The Rules of Inheritance, visit rememberingalife.com slash giveaways.